three, two, one. It is started. Okay. Well, I'd like to welcome everybody here to our uh, seminar series. And today I'm really excited that we have an outside speaker, Sarah Hurd, Dr. Sarah Hurd. She's an assistant professor at UConn in the Department of, of Molecular and Cell Biology. Sarah and I both serve on a graduate student's PhD committee, and that's why I met her uh, during the course of, of those um, committee meetings and such. And um, Sarah is, uh, she got her undergraduate and her master's in Idaho and did a PhD at Louisiana State University and then postdoc at UC Davis before coming to the station, I mean, coming to, excuse me, to Yukon in uh, 2016. And her interests are very fascinating. She, she's very interested in, in the evolution of host associated microbiomes and microbial phylogeography. And she's been using a lot of computational tools to answer some questions about those populations. And specifically, she's focusing on the shape, oh, on what factors shape and maintain the gut microbiome of wild birds, which will be the title of her talk today, Birds and Bacteria, the Evolution of the Avian Microbiome. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for the invitation. I'm really excited to be here today to talk about all those things you just listed. So um, yeah, let's get started. I like to start my talks with a definition of this word, um, microbiome, because some people have heard it and some people are confused by it, including people who study it. So in this definition, a characteristic microbial community found in a particular environment, I have two key words. So microbial here means all microorganisms. We've got eukaryotes, bacteria, archaea, viruses. Um, every microbe is in this microbial community. And the particular environment part means that microbiomes are defined by their surroundings. So we can talk about the human microbiome, which would include every microbe on every human, perhaps throughout their entire life or over evolutionary time. Or we can talk about the skin microbiome, on the dominant hand of bus riders in New Haven during flu season. It really depends on the question. You'll notice in this little cartoon microbiome I have labeled here, some ecological or population level processes, and that's because the microbiome is a community. And this is what I envision when I think about the microbiome in a natural state. So this is a microscopy image of a dental plaque where seven bacterial genera have been highlighted and something very similar to this structure is likely in a lot of our mouths right now. Um, and I think this is a lovely visual of how microbiomes are three-dimensional communities where individuals live in close association with both intra and interspecific neighbors. But the microbiome can also be viewed as a trait of a host. It's a distinguishing characteristic of an individual and an aggregate of populations. And if we take that one step further back to the big question that I'm most interested in, we have this. What is the role of the microbiome in evolution? And for me, that's birds. The hosts that we're talking about today um, are birds. And this big picture question can't be answered experimentally. I can't use model organisms. So my research program mostly focuses on wild organisms and comparative methods. So today I'm talking about um, why microbes are so fascinating and relevant, why birds are a great study system to ask microbiome questions, and then I'm going to talk more in depth about a recently completed um, research project from my lab looking at evolutionary signal in avian microbiomes. And my goal today is for everyone um, not to just learn something, but hopefully to learn something interesting. And so um, I'm sure some of the background information some of you will already know, but I, I hope to keep everyone on the same page throughout the entire talk. Okay, so why microbes? To understand the role that microbiomes play in vertebrate evolution, the first thing to know is this. So microbes are everywhere, not only in our three-dimensional world, but when you go back through time, microbes are there. They evolved somewhere close to four billion years ago. We have fossils from approximately three and a half billion years ago. This is obviously a long time, and that's especially true for microorganisms who can reproduce asexually and sometimes exponentially. This translates to a lot of generations, um, and that's probably an understatement. And we can compare that to animals or to vertebrates or to birds. Um, here on this timeline is where Archaeopteryx shows up. Microbes were ubiquitous and highly specialized well before birds entered the picture. So animals evolved in a microbial world. 
There are also interesting things happening right here. So microbes are everywhere, including in our cells. The birth of eukaryotes, our lineage, um, everything that has a nucleus includes microbes because um, some organelles, specifically mitochondria and chloroplasts, were once free living microbes that were engulfed by another prokaryote. And instead of being digested, they developed this strong and mutually beneficial symbiotic relationship that has resulted in the eukaryote cell structure we see today. Microbial genes are everywhere too. Through the process of horizontal gene transfer, some bacteria are capable of giving and receiving genes in a non-vertical way or from places other than their parent cells. Parent cell. The, we frequently talk about a tree of life, but it's likely better represented as a really tangled bush like this figure here, um, where genes and pieces of genomes have made significant jumps across our um, evolutionary tree. But the amount of non-vertical transfer that um, bacteria are capable of probably varies a lot across different clades, and that's what part B and C of this figure are meant to represent. All these things are represented in our genomes as well. So 37% of our genes have homologs with microbial genes, whereas only about 6% of our genes are um, restricted to primates. The last consideration here is that we're holobionts. So we are greater than the sum of our human parts, meaning that on our bodies, we have more bacterial cells than human cells. This is a figure from a 2016 paper where they estimated that we have 38 trillion bacteria on our bodies and 30 trillion human cells. Uh, when we look at the cumulative mass of our cells, of course, we see a different picture. Our human cells weigh much more than our bacterial ones um, weigh, which is that sliver right there. But cell for cell, we are more bacterial than human. In our genome, there's roughly uh, 22,000 genes, and collectively the members of our microbiome contain um, an unknown number of genes to be, to be frank about it, but it's estimated that there are 2 million, maybe 3 million, maybe 4 million, up to 8 million genes in the human microbiome. So even if we're semi-conservative and cap it at 2 million, that's a 100 to 1 ratio of unique microbial genes to human genes um, uh, in the human microbiome versus the human genome. And I truly find that amazing. So to answer the question, why microbes? Um, I summarize that as microbes are everywhere. Moving on to a short introduction of why birds. So a lot of interest in microbiomes stems from our desire to live long, healthy lives and to look and feel good while we do it. So that's, I think, the biggest reason that um, most vertebrate microbiome literature is on mammals, including charismatic um, species in zoos. We have primates, there's companion animals, um, model organisms like mice and rats make up a lot of vertebrate microbiome research. And of course, um, a lot of the research has been on humans and specifically the human fecal microbiome. We've learned a lot from these studies, but not everything we've learned may translate to other classes of organisms because um, two important features of mammals strongly shape their microbiomes. So those are live birth through a vaginal canal that may be densely populated with bacteria and an early exclusive diet of milk, um, which is a dynamic food source produced by a mother's body that can seed and structure the baby's microbiome uh, very heavily. Birds, on the other hand, have neither milk nor live birth. Parents will build a nest, usually, where the mother lays the eggs from her cloaca, the eggs are incubated and then hatch. So the first exposure birds have to our microbial world is usually within the nest. Species with altricial young will then feed the little helpless babies and this diet is usually insects or fish, something high in protein, precocial young hatch and are all feeding themselves soon after birth. In other words, no milk. <laughs> Birds also possess their own suite of adaptations that are likely to affect their microbiomes. So one unique feature of birds is their feathers, and this is an incredibly important and robust structure. So they're used for warmth, camouflage, communication, and of course, flight. The selection for powered flight has affected a lot of bird biology from anatomy to genome size. So maybe selection for flight has affected the microbiome in ways that we don't appreciate yet. 
Flight also makes it possible for birds to migrate, sometimes across the entire globe, like this Arctic Terns journey here on the right. And relating that back to the microbiome, migrating birds are exposed to many different environments, possibly needing to eat diverse foods and to deal with novel pathogens. Does the microbiome assist with how they deal with those pressures? We don't know, or we're figuring that out. Within birds, there is amazing morphological and ecological diversity, as you can see between this hummingbird in the upper left and those ostriches, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. How do these traits and features and natural histories and evolution relate to the microbiome? Bird microbiome research more or less originated with the world's most famous bird, which of course is the chicken. Some estimates say humans began domesticating the red jungle fowl uh, over there on the left as many as 10 or 12,000 years ago. And although the initial reasons may have been pest control and hygiene instead of uh, strictly as a food source, the chicken has been tightly linked to modern civilization for a very long time. We can see that quite clearly here. Um, I've plotted the modern population sizes for the red jungle fowl and all the world's domestic dogs and cats is just a reference. We have humans on this population chart as well from 2017, close to 7 billion people. And I've also put the largest estimated species size of the passenger pigeon, um, which is currently extinct, but it's an ornithological touchstone and notorious for extremely large population size, uh, sizes and flocks in the billions. So how many chickens are on the planet right now is um, quite a lot, 20 billion, 21 billion, roughly three for every one human. Um, so it makes sense that chickens are our first and best studied bird microbiome. This is a figure from a 2001 paper where these columns are clone libraries of bacteria from the cecum of chickens and the relative abundance of each of these 18, of, um, these 18 bacterial taxa over on the right, how um, abundant they are in each of those clone libraries. The chicken is where we also start to see sequencing of, of these entire communities using this important marker that we hear a lot about in microbial ecology or 16S rRNA. So I'm taking a quick detour to mention 16S because it's so um, common in microbiome studies. And that's because 16S is a part of the small subunit of the ribosome. The ribosome is the part of the cell where protein synthesis occurs. So that's where transcribed genes get get translated into a protein. And this function is so important that it is conserved across all bacteria. And the selection for that function is so strong that we have a gene that looks like this. So this is the entire 16S gene. It's around 1500 bases long. And because again of that strong selection, we have some regions on the gene that are highly conserved across all of bacteria. And these highly conserved regions flank hypervariable regions. This is an incredibly useful trait for molecular biology because it means we can put primers down in the highly conserved regions and sequence across the variable region to give us some um, taxonomic information from all the bacteria in a mixed sample using one homologous marker. Thus, 16S sequencing is one of the major tools of microbial ecology. Back to chickens real quick. Because of chickens, we know some things that we've learned about mammal microbiomes, which again are far more commonly studied. We know some of the information does translate to at least some birds. So because of chickens, we see that different organs in the chicken digestive tract house distinct microbiomes. We know that um, we know who some of the major players are in the microbiomes, proteobacteria, firmicutes, bacteroidetes, um, all similar to a lot of mammal microbiome um, composition. We see an increase in bacterial diversity and density as we go through the digestive tract. And another important trait of chickens is that we can use them experimentally because we know their biology and husbandry so well. So chickens have been very important, but chickens are just one species and they have had a fairly exceptional recent evolutionary history. So I'm more interested in the 10,000 or so other species and how natural selection affects the relationship between birds and microbes. For the most part, we know nothing about bird, bird microbiomes, most species of birds, um, but some species we do know and a few we know quite well. So these are pictures of study organisms that um, have been used in microbiome studies to show something major. Just real quickly, 
One important thing we know from both mammals and birds uh, and fish and non-avian reptiles and amphibians is that captivity really alters the microbiome. This paper on the capricale was important, especially for me because it showed exactly that. We can't use zoos to answer every question. The avian microbiome is dynamic and responds to changes over very short periods of time. So this was a really important paper for my research um, interests. In 2009, a paper came out showing that in Adeli penguins, um, the microbiome correlates better to genetic distance than geographic distance. Um, this was a pretty small paper. They used only two colonies of breeding birds, but this was the uh, one of the first papers to get wild bird microbiomes and things like geography and genetics um, into the literature. We know that microbiomes can facilitate complex ecologies, like how the microbiome assists in the dietary specialization of vultures, which live off of carrion or um, dead animals. And the Watson is one of the birds we know the best, microbially speaking, because it's so weird. So this bird lives in South America and it's the only filivorous or leaf eating flying bird. Leaves are a poor nutrient source, but the Watson is able to live off of just leaves because it has an enlarged crop seen here, where it stores leaves and um, partially digests them before sending it the foodstuffs down to the rest of the digestive tract. Because of the Watson, we've been able to use comparative analyses to identify evolutionary processes that are taking place in and across microbiomes. So the crop microbiome of the Watson is functionally convergent to a cow's rumen. They both digest tough leafy material and they are compositionally convergent. So some of the nearest phylogenetic relatives of the microbes in the Watson crop have been found in cow rumens. This brings up one of the things I am most interested in. So birds have immense morphological diversity and microbiomes, again, are defined by their environment. So these are six birds with specific organs highlighted um, with substantial changes in scale. The different organs perform different functions, but homologous organs perform the same function. They're just in different hosts. So what microbiome patterns are there across species in the same organs? And we finally made it to some of my research. So with this project, we wanted to look at two closely related species across the digestive tract to see how distinct different microbiomes are. And the really cool thing about this system is that we know diet can strongly affect a microbiome. These two species, the semi-palmated sandpiper and the dunlin, were from the exact same geographic location, Delaware Bay, Delaware, where they both stop over during migration. During this time, their diets are overwhelmingly horseshoe crab eggs. Both of them are just um, gorging themselves on the same um, food. So they're in the same site, they're eating the same thing, and they're genetically similar but distinct. So how different are the microbiomes here? This is the dissected shorebird digestive tract showing where we sampled. The esophagus, um, the proventriculus is the bird's chemical stomach. It is a low pH region where it starts to break down food. The gizzard is their physical stomach because birds don't have teeth. They frequently have rocks or grit in their gizzards, which grinds up hard materials that haven't been digested by the low pH. Small intestine is where nutrient absorption occurs. The cica is a highly variable um, structure in birds. Um, it's for fermentation of food and or water balance and or nitrogen cycling and or immune functions. Um, and the large intestine is where nutrient and water absorption occur. For this paper, this is my method slide. We used um, dead birds. We dissected out the digestive tract and sequenced, extracted total DNA and sequenced the V4 region of 16S. Um, we then sequenced on an Illumina high throughput sequencer and most data analysis was conducted using various R packages. So we used six birds from each species. This bar graph is showing you the relative abundance of different bacterial phyla in each sample of the six semi-palmated sandpiper esophaguses. We see that they all share the fact that they have at least 25% proteobacteria, that's in pink. There are some firmicutes in blue, and then they individually have um, varying amounts of fusobacteria in green. Um, everything 
outside, these seven phyla that are named on the right were lumped together in black. When we look at all of our sites, I admit this looks like a bit of a disco mess is what I would call it, um, but that's a theme in bird microbiome research. We see a lot of mess. We can visually detect some patterns. We see lots of pink, that's the proteobacteria. We see lots of individual variation, meaning that within the same site, within the same species, we still see pretty large shifts in the relative abundance of the different categories. Um, and in the cecum and large intestine, we start to see a lot more deferobacters and um, bacteroidetes. Um, this is kind of a raw data slide, so looking at our samples in a different way, here each point represents one sample. The shapes are the two species and the colors are the different digestive sites. This is a NMDS ordination where we take a big multidimensional data set and force it onto two axes so we can see the similarities between samples. So samples that are closer together physically are more similar. And so here are the things that I see. I see that the cecum and the large intestine, the darkest colors, um, are distinct from the other sites. I see um, the upper digestive tract, the warm colors, the esophagus, proventriculus, and gizzard are especially overlapping um, and distinct again from the cecum and large intestine. And I can see that the small intestine or the light blue is moderately distinct from the other sites and has a lot of spread in that one digestive site. I also see that the Dunlin and the semi-palmated samples are not particularly distinct. So species of bird does not seem to distinguish the samples very well. The last thing I wanna show from this paper is this, where do the microbes in a microbiome come from? Because digestive tracts are mostly unidirectional, uh, not strictly, but mostly, it's intuitive to wonder if the microbes lower in the gastrointestinal tract are being sourced from microbes higher in the gastrointestinal tract. So here we used a program to estimate exactly that. When we designate the anterior organs as potential sources for microbes, can we assign the source of the microbiome in the gut? These results suggest no. So the six Dunlin and the six semi-palmated are both shown here. Each bar shows how much of each microbiome can be attributed to our two sources for this site, the esophagus, which was our actual esophagus samples, or an unknown or other source. We can see that the esophagus community is generally not the source for the majority of the proventriculus community across our 12 samples. When we go a little further down to the gizzard, a couple of our samples seem to be highly sourced from anterior organs, but we still see a lot of the community across our samples are from unknown sources. Small intestine is a similar story. The cecum, even higher unknown sources. And the large intestine shows um, relatively quite a bit of cecal source, but still a lot of gray. One of the weaknesses of this study was that we didn't actually sample horseshoe crab eggs. So I kind of think that's what other, a large majority of this other actually is, and that's probably the horseshoe crab eggs. So bird microbiomes show patterns by organ. Within organs, we don't see a strong host species effect. They have substantial intra-individual variation, and at every site, a lot of the community is coming from some sort, some source that is not a previous gastrointestinal site. This is published um, in Royal Society Open Science if you want to read more. So why birds is because bird microbiomes are wicked awesome, which is my summary of those past uh, dozen slides. Okay, so part three. Now we're gonna take a deep dive into phylogenetic comparative methods. Going back to this slide, for this project, we're going to treat the microbiome as a single trait. And the goal is to understand the evolution of the microbiome. I've been interested in the relationship between host phylogeny and the microbiome for a long time. So this is a figure from a chapter of my dissertation where we looked at 59 species of bird from Costa Rica. This is a phylogeny of the birds using mitochondrial ND2 and the colors represent different bird orders. Most are orange because uh, the order Passeriformes is the largest uh, bird order. So I sequenced an intestinal microbiome sample from each of these individuals and then analyzed them as a community 
to create this, a dendrogram of relatedness. Just like in the phylogeny, the less branch length there is between two leaves on the tree, the more similar they are. The problem is when you know who the microbiomes came from, there's no real correlation here between host and microbiomes. This is um, a mess. Um, and so I think part of the problem is that this was just a visual interpretation. And what we really need to understand the relationship between the microbiome as a trait of a host is phylogenetic comparative methods. If we want to understand any trait of a host across species, we cannot ignore phylogeny. So this is a landmark paper from Joe Felsenstein that introduces the problem of comparing traits from different species and treating those data as independent. The basic problem is this. If we have a comparative question we want to answer, like do bigger birds have more feathers? If we measure two traits for 40 hypothetical species, like weight and number of feathers, and plot X versus Y like this, it appears to be a clear positive correlation between two traits across the species. However, if we also consider the underlying phylogeny, the underlying evolutionary relatedness for these 40 species, we might see something different. So here we would see no correlation between the traits when we try to factor in how closely related they are. So phylogeny is fundamental for understanding traits and trait evolution. To ask these comparative questions and to understand traits across species, we need to account for this potential non-independence and use these phylogenetic comparative methods. To do that, we start with a phylogeny of the host species, and we need to have empirical trait values for the trait that we're interested in measured for each of our species. We can then infer the state of the internal nodes for the whole tree, including the ancestral node, and then once we have the ancestral node in a phylogeny, we can test models of evolution to see how well they fit the observed data. For example, say we have four models, we want to test that vary in evolutionary parameters like selection, drift, migration. We can use the single phylogeny and the value of the ancestral node to simulate what the trait values will be under those different models, like so. And then we use the original empirical value as a comparison to each of the four models. And then we use an information criterion like a weighted Akaiki information criterion or AICW to determine which model is best supported. In this example, the lower right purplish model received 90% of the support, so we would be fairly confident that this is the best model. However, if you see something like this where all four models were roughly equally weighted, we would not have much confidence that any model is better than any of the others. Thus, we can find support for and distinguish between basic evolutionary processes like selection and drift using these methods. This makes um, Darwin give a thumbs up. OK, so we are looking at the microbiome of birds and to do that for this project, we used 74 species of birds from Equatorial Guinea, seen here. Um, and this project was done mostly by Darian Kapunitan and myself in my lab, but Oscar Johnson and Dr. Ryan Terrell were the ones who did all the field work in Africa. Our methods here are roughly the same as the first paper I showed you. So, um, with the exception of now we were focusing on the lower intestine of birds. We extracted and sequenced the V4 region and amplified or sequenced on an Illumina machine and then data analysis was done using various R packages. So this is another of those raw data slides um, showing you the average relative abundance of bacterial phyla for each sample. This is the individual level of that, where each column represents one sample and the colors are the percentages of each sample belonging to the different phyla. Most have a lot of firmicutes, proteobacteria, and um, actinobacteria, so green, blue, and pink. There is a, quite a bit of inter and intraspecific variation here. So for the actual data, it contained 140 samples from 92 birds belonging to 74 species. We have both gut replicate data and some sequencing replicate data so that the small black bars in the middle of this figure are showing you which samples came from 
a single individual. Um, and these are what we're using for the empirical trait values for our phylogenetic comparative method. The phylogeny underlying our samples looks like this, where we had two doves, one shorebird, one cuckoo, one swift, two kingfishers, three woodpeckers, and then 63 songbirds. Uh, this is taxonomically skewed, but that's just because biology is taxonomically skewed in birds um, at this site. Um, okay, so we have the tree, we have our traits, and now we're going to talk about the models we're going to use. So the first model is our neutral model, so a Brownian motion model. We use a single parameter, sigma, the evolutionary rate parameter, to approximate a random walk away from a starting value. This is sometimes called a drunkard's walk because from an initial value, we're taking small random steps away from it. Brownian motion models are an important null model in a lot of applications, and this, again, is our neutral model. The second model is the ornstein uhlenbeck model, or the OU model. Um, here we have a Brownian motion model with one additional parameter, that's our selection parameter. So here a trait evolves at random around an optimum value, um, but the further the random walk gets away from the optimum, the more pull there is back towards it. So the further the drunkard gets away from the lamppost, the stronger the pull is back towards the lamppost kind of like a rubber band, and that's our selection. The early burst model is another Brownian motion model that allows for changes in sigma or the step size over time. So I think of um, that as, again, changes in the step size of our inebriated gentleman. <laughs> um, this allows for some randomness to have more of an effect when there's abundant niche space, for example, um, that an organism can take advantage of, um, which is abundant, but then slows as the niches become filled. And lastly, the fourth model we included is the white noise model. So we wanted to make sure that if we're partitioning our um, support across models, we wanted to include one that meant there was um, no phylogenetic information at all in our empirical traits. So here we have the white noise model in which traits change too quickly to contain any phylogenetic signal at all. The first thing we did was to see which models were supported when we analyzed bird mass. So this is a traditional trait where based on the literature, we have some expectation of which of the four models will fit. Within bird, work, within bird orders, previous work has shown that Brownian motion is a good model and across, model, across orders, excuse me, early burst is well supported. So our trait looks like this, which is basically a heat map of the trait values um, for bird mass across the phylogeny. And our model support look like, looks like this. So that is a mix of the models that we expected to be supported. Brownian motion is supported three times stronger than either of the other models, which include Ornstein, Uhlenbeck, and Early Burst, and no white noise is in this um, support. So that's roughly what we expected. Um, to be more confident that our Brownian motion model was supported here, we modeled Brownian motion and white noise onto the tree and then analyzed the same four models and we got these results. So we can see that a pr pure Brownian motion model and pure white noise simulations are not 100% supported by their own models, but we can still see a difference between the two and see how these models look on our exact tree. We go back to the traits, look at the light green, the firmicutes on this chart, and we average and model the relative abundance on the phylogeny, use our comparative methods, and here the OU model is highly supported. That's the gray. Um, this was the model that includes selection and in how the contemporary, uh, in the contemporary distribution of the trait. But when we look at proteobacteria, on the other hand, here we are strongly supporting the white noise model, where we have too much variation in the trait for it to contain any phylogenetic signal. When I tested the six most abundant bacterial phyla, um, they were all a mix of the white noise and ornstein uhlenbeck model, except for varicomicrobia, which looks a little different. And we believe that's because of a single individual, this cuckoo, which branches quite early in our phylogeny, we only had one sample for this branch and um, 
this bird had like 34, 30 fold more varicomicrobia than all the other samples. Um, so that's one of the drawbacks of this study is that we only had this single individual for this lineage. Um, so we can't really say whether varicomicrobia is evolving differently than the rest of the bacterial phyla or if this individual was just sick or something like that. So I put this very professional looking scribble through that result for now. I suppose I probably should have put a question mark instead, <laughs> uh, but that's pending further investigation. I also ran a measure of alpha diversity through the model. So how many uh, bacteria were found in each of our bird microbiomes? Um, and we got the mix of Ornstein, Uhlenbeck, and white noise again. And when we look at beta diversity, um, I took the first two NMDS coordinates for each sample in ordination to see um, if the differences between samples was neutral in a phylogenetic comparative context. And again, we get this mix of Ornstein, Uhlenbeck, and white noise. Um, and so we see this fairly overwhelming signature of Ornstein, Uhlenbeck, and white noise combinations across all these different traits. So the conclusions here are that a neutral model, Brownian motion, does not fit the avian microbiome. We saw no evidence for Brownian motion, a pure neutral model, fitting these traits. Second, selection may be constraining the composition of these communities. And or what I think is more likely, the avian microbiome, as measured by 16S and relative abundance of bacterial phyla, does not contain phylogenetic signal. This was um, published in 2020 in Molecular Ecology if you want to read more. More details about phylogenetic comparative methods, I'm sure <laughs> you want to. Um, so bring it back, bringing it back to birds and bird biology. There's good biological reasons to believe that birds have a high amount of environmental influence in their microbiomes, and there may not be a strong phylogenetic correlation between what's in the lumen of their guts and their evolutionary history. Um, so that may be what we are recovering, uh, but this brings me to the issues that we're currently investigating in my lab. Um, 16S and relative abundance of phyla are a pretty blunt instrument when we want to define microbiome traits. So here's a different data set I analyzed in the same using the same methods. And again, when we look at bacterial phyla, that's what you're seeing here. We see the OU and white noise models for most phyla with some early birth support for a couple of them. However, if I analyze the data at the level of bacterial order, if we look at the evolutionary history of bacterial orders, we see that some phyla, some orders within a phylum, show the same patterns as the bacterial phylum. That's this orange highlighting showing you that these three orders within the acidobacteria basically also show the OU white noise combination. But if we look at the act the orders within actinobacteria, we have one example here that looks a lot more like Brownian motion than this OU white noise split. And the point here is that the way we define microbiome traits is going to matter quite a bit. Um, and I'm not convinced that we have the correct microbiome traits defined at this point because it's a very hard thing to do. And remember that we've used 16S for these data more specifically, a single variable region from this single locus, um, which has been very useful for microbial ecology, but we can only infer the history of that one marker using 16S. We know nothing about the functions of the microbiome based off of 16S. Um, we know that functions within a microbiome may be more consistent and even more influential than just taxonomy. So this is a figure from a 2012 Nature paper that compared um, 16S taxonomic classifications and the metabolic pathways as measured by shotgun metagenomics in a bunch of samples across different human microbiome environments like nose, mouth, and fecal samples. Each column is one person and then they um, analyzed the different samples in, in two ways. So 16S to look at the taxa in the sample and function and what we can see is that within our body sites, 16S contains a lot more variation than the metabolic pathways. 
So again, this is just getting back to the question of, are we actually defining the microbiome traits in the most appropriate way? And we are actively collecting data on these multiple different data types to put them through phylogenetic comparative methods in my lab um, right now. Finally, bringing it back to my big, big question, the role of the microbiome in avian evolution. Well, that's that's what we're working on. Um, we've got a lot of cool work in progress in my lab um, and. That's it. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you for the invitation um, and I am more than happy to take any questions. Well, thank you, Sarah. Like I said, if we were in person, we'd be giving you a roaring applause right now. But <laughs> Oh, I can hear it in my head. Yeah, we're doing it virtually right now. But at any rate, um, there's a few questions I, I have. I mean, I, I'm thinking about the only big bird population we have here commercially in the state is, of course, chickens, as you mentioned earlier. Has Have they ever associated a certain microbiome with, with uh, chicken health? I know we've had some cascading failures in some of these birdhouses. I was wondering, did, have you ever had a chance to get in there and look at differences? So I have not, but I do know that that is a major active area of research and that um, with getting away from antibiotics to help chickens grow bigger, stronger, faster, um, they're turning to probiotics and prebiotics. So things like the right diet to feed a healthy microbiome for chicken health um, and things like actual bacteria, like we eat yogurt to try to keep a healthy microbiome to use fermented foods to keep our microbiomes happy. Um, they're doing that in chickens as well. And I think it's probably more likely that they're finding particular microbiome types associated with lack of health or illness or sickness or not productivity. So. Um, it is a tool that's being used in in poultry industry for sure. Um, and there are likely patterns. <laughs> mm -hmm. OK, um, I have to show my ignorance. Uh, what are the Vero co microbia? That is just a bacterial phylum that shows up in low but pretty consistent um, abundances across birds. There are some known pathogens in that group, but generally speaking, I believe there's a, a lot of anaerobic bacteria in that group. And beyond that, it bacterial phylum is such a big <laughs> characterization that I don't have good specifics beyond that, I guess. Um, OK. Mm. Um, you mentioned uh, the 16S not yielding the or not was was not the best tool for answering your questions. What uh, would you think entire sequencing is is the way to go here, or like in metagenomics is what you were referring to, right? Yep, yep. We are interested in both metagenomics, so shotgun metagenomics, where you just take a sample, randomly chop up all the DNA, and then randomly sequence as much of that those random pieces as you can to try to get a good um, snapshot of the genes that are within your within your sample. So hopefully you'll get more than just housekeeping genes, um, but to show you what's the active potential of a sample. And we're also looking at metatranscriptomics. So that's where you take the RNA in a sample and try to figure out what genes are being actively transcribed at that exact moment um, to again, try to get a picture of what's happening within your community. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a question here. Um, Dr. Hurd, great talk. I'm wondering if you could reverse the analysis and map the microbial traits onto the phylogeny. In other words, firmicutes are largely anaerobic. Does that map to bird phylogeny? That is a great question and um, I have not tried that, but it would be a really good idea to do, especially at probably not, well, maybe at the phylum level, but that's kind of where I was, that would be really useful for either functional traits that we're really interested in, like do, um, do we see like chitinase genes in insectivorous birds that need particular 
uh, bacterial genes to break down insect shells or something, map that back onto the phylogeny. And I would be really interested to see um, those patterns, but that's that's basically the other side of the same question that we're trying to get at with the phylogenetic comparative methods, but yes. Um, OK, uh, another question. Is there any study including fungi and why are fungi left out? <laughs> That is another great question. So fungi, I have left out fungi because it's a whole other data type that is expensive to get. <laughs> um, and the analyses are less straightforward, as you probably know. Um, the, the marker that's most frequently used to characterize fungi for microbiome studies is ITS, and that's not a, it's not a phylogenetic marker, so it's kind of harder to um, analyze, in my opinion. And I haven't had a student who's really interested <laughs> in fungi, but that is another avenue that we are pursuing right now in my lab to look at not just bacteria, but also fungi, um, other eukaryotes, and archaea as well, and viruses. Um, we're trying to create a data set that has all of those and look for patterns. Uh, the, another question, which you may have a, a, a touched on, is was a nice talk. Do you have plans to expand this research beyond 16S? In other words, transcriptomics and functional characterization. Yes, yes, yes. So um, we're writing a paper right now that is using metatranscriptomics. A couple of my grad students um, have both metagenomic and metatranscriptomic data. Um, I'm trying to get money to do the um, to do all different um, classes of life, like the eukaryotes and archaea and viruses. Um, but yes, I think if anything, I have shown that strictly using 16S is insufficient for, for certain things. Mm -hmm. I had a quick question. Uh, what, funding, what funding agencies are you finding most supportive of your research? <laughs> I have one small grant from the NSF and just got really devastating comments from a bigger grant from the NSF. Uh, and I have one grant into the NIH. I'm looking to the USDA possibly for a thing that we're developing in my lab. Um, but honestly, getting bird microbiome funded as a basic science has been <laughs> not, it hasn't gone well so far. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I had one quick question. It's a methods question. When you are extracting out the long, the uh, large intestines, do, does it do you does it, does it go through a rinse to remove external contaminants and such? And you're only looking for the internal. Yes. Yeah, so we can do a low concentration bleach rinse of the outside of the um, of the outside of the gut, and then use sterile equipment to get to the inside. Yes. Right. Very similar to what we do when we isolate pathogens and such. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> OK, I don't see any other questions in our box, but I'm sure people will might be contacting you later on with more questions. We had uh, 42 people listening to your talk today, so right. it was well received. Right. And we certainly appreciate your time, and we're going to give you another virtual clap um, <laughs> from here. And Thanks again I guess, for the invitation. And I'll see you at the next committee meeting. <laughs> Great. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Bye you again, everyone. sir.